so let's go to our second talk of the day. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Sinan Ariturk uh, talking uh, about um, a game value maximization for surface of revolution with pres prescribed boundary. Okay, thank you. Sinan. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for including me in this. Uh, this colloquium. Uh, it's a great honor to speak here, great pleasure. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, a theorem in spectral geometry. So in spectral geometry, what you do is you look at a, a domain or a shape, and then you want to study the Laplacian on that shape. And you want to look uh, in particular at the spectrum. And then you want to try and understand, as you change the geometry of the underlying shape, how is that reflected in changing the spectrum? Okay, now a nice setting for this is a, a Riemannian manifold, in which case we're talking about the, the Laplace Beltrami operator. Okay, so this is a Laplacian canonical Laplace makes sense on a Riemannian manifold. I guess first you define the gradient. So you take a gradient of a smooth function, you get a vector field. And as a property, if you take inner product with vector x, you get directional derivative of f in the direction x. OK, and then Laplacian will be the divergence of the gradient. So you want to take Laplacian of phi integrated against another function, psi. And you move the derivative, you get inner product of the two gradients integral. OK, and this will be true for smooth, compactly supported. OK, so this is kind of a hope, try a quick definition of Laplace Beltrami operator. And then I'm interested in eigenvalues. OK, so naturally I look at this equation. I guess we can see here in the definition that Laplacian is a negative operator. So we get minus Laplacian. These eigenvalues will be non-negative. And I want to look at a boundary condition. I use phi equals 0 on the boundary. It's called the Dirichlet eigenvalues. OK, and a fundamental fact is that eigenvalues exist. And they form a sequence that goes to infinity. I guess here m is compact. Boundary is smooth. OK, now the problem is to you know, look at the Riemannian manifold and see how is, how is the geometry of the Riemannian manifold reflected in, in these eigenvalues. These are now like, uh, we've defined them intrinsically. These are isometric invariant functions on Riemannian manifolds. OK, I guess if you're in one dimension, you know, your manifold will just be an interval. Your eigenfunction, you can solve it. It'll be like sinusoidal functions. You get Fourier sine series. OK, so here you can compute everything explicitly. And you see that the eigenfunctions are representing your vibrations of the string. Eigenvalues are representing the, the tones of vibration. And uh, this is sort of a silly picture of two dimensions. Instead of a string, you're going to think about a drum. You have a, some shape of your drum. And then you know, as you have a, a strangely shaped drum, you want to try and see what are the tones of vibration. So I guess first thing you can see is it's uh, you know, it's, it's, un, it's unlikely you're going to solve this explicitly. So it's a good topic to try and prove, uh, you know, math theorems about. OK. They're kind of uh, only special cases, highly symmetric cases where you can compute explicitly. It's hard to get a handle on the eigenfunctions. OK, so one of the most useful things to, to control them is this Rayleigh quotient characterization. This is a variational characterization of the eigenvalues. I'm mostly going to be concerned with the first eigenvalue. OK, so I have a function on the manifold. The really question is the, uh, 
ratio, I take the square integral of the gradient divided by the square integral. Okay, I wanted to test functions, all the functions that vanish on the boundary. Try and minimize this. That will give me first eigenvalues. Okay, this gamma minimum will be attained by the first eigenfunction. Okay, and I guess we see a few nice things here. One property we see is like a domain mononicity. If you have a set A, it contain a larger set B. Then we can see right away the eigenvalue of A is going to be larger than eigenvalue of B. We'll take a minimum over a smaller set, you just extend by zero. Okay, another thing we can see is, so it's, it's extremely hard to compute these and understand the relationship, but this is a nice, easy way to get upper bounds. Okay, so I can just pick any test function f. If I compute this Rayleigh quotient, I have an upper bound for lambda 1. <coughs> Okay, and the third thing I guess that's nice is you can sort of intuit, have, get some intuition of what the eigenfunctions will look like. So if I have this set, when I have this minimization problem, I want to have a function with fairly large square integral. I don't want to have very much gradient. Okay, and now when I'm zero on the boundary, I want to lift off. I guess you can see it would be like inefficient to put a lot of gradient here. If I lift up, I have to go back down very quickly. All right, so it's be more efficient here. Gray will be larger here, small here. A contour plot looks something like this. Okay, and the contours kind of resist going into the corners. They're going pretty slowly. Okay, so I'll talk about an eigenvalue optimization theorem. Um, so we're going to look at you know, some class of Riemannian manifolds and try and look at which one is going to have the uh, biggest or smallest eigenvalue in that class. I think uh, you know, there's a lot of nice theorems in this spirit. The oldest one is this Faber-Cron inequality from 1920s. So you look at domains in the plane. with fixed area. Okay, you want to try and maximize or minimize. Okay, the theorem says that the minimum eigenvalue, or the smallest eigenvalue will be attained by the disk. So the disk has the smallest lambda 1. Okay, I guess in Israeli question, it's pictured it's sort of believable if you have some corners like this. It's not an efficient use of your area. And you know, rounding out most symmetric shape is going to be most efficient having a, a small Rayleigh quotient. OK, and there's a lot more theorems of, of this spirit. You look at some class, some restriction, and try and optimize the email within that. I want to look at this question. I'm going to fix a circle in R3, and I want to look at surfaces in R3 whose boundary is, is the circle. Oh, because this is something like it's inspired by plateau problem, I guess. We want to try and see, can we minimize the first eigenvalue? Can we maximize the first eigenvalue? So the minimization problem is not very interesting. Minimum is going to be 
it's just going to be 0. OK, an example would be, here's my circle. <coughs> I'll just take, I can do basically anything down here. And then I have a second connected component, like a sphere. OK, I can define, I can see, I'll just define a function at 0 on the disk. And then it's going to be some constant, like 1 on the sphere. So it's locally constant, it's harmonic. OK, so I get eigenvalues here. OK, so you could say this is a dumb example because it's not connected. We should just look for connected sets. In that case, uh, well, it's, it's still not a nice problem. You're going to get a femum of lambda 1, 0. We can sort of approximate this example. We just build like a little bridge with the cylinder here. OK, and as the radius of the cylinder goes to 0, this will, eigenvalue will converge to 0. OK, and you can see this. This is a good example of like using the Rayleigh course to get upper bound. You know, it's, this is a service, uh, the exact eigenvalue function. It'll be like approximately 0 on the disk, but increasing. Approximately 1 on the sphere, but not exactly. Approximately linear there. But computing exactly is not easy. But we can get easy bound. We'll just choose a test function that's exactly 0, exactly 1, and exactly linear. OK, and we take its Rayleigh quotient. The square root of the gradient is just, we take this integral on the cylinder. It's like pointwise constant, and the measure is going to 0. And the inner square root of the function is going to look like the surface area of this sphere. OK, so those upper bounds go to 0. OK, so this is not a, not a very interesting question. How about maximization? OK, actually, sup lambda 1 is going to be infinity. OK, and I, I think you can show this with some kind of like Nash embedding theorem. I don't want to look at this too much. I want to just say that the disk in particular does not maximize. OK, we could show this uh, variationally. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to take a function that should equal 0 on the boundary. Now I look at the graph of psi. I look at uh, this family of surfaces. It'll be the graph of t times. OK, now I want to look at the eigenvalues of these surfaces and try and take derivatives. OK, t was our data graph of 0. We have the disk. This derivative is going to be, well, this will be 0 because sigma t is isometric to sigma minus t. Isometric sure that the same eigenvalues. It's an even function. So we get first derivative is 0. OK, second derivative is uh, more interesting. OK, so I guess Berger studied, um, you know, how does the eigenvalue vary? How do you take these variational formulas as the metric varies? And he has derived some formulas. And in a special case for this circumstance, we get this. A second variation formula. Okay, so we've got uh, what's happening here. Lambda, I guess, is the eigenvalue on the disk. Phi is the eigenfunction on the disk. Psi is the vice we use to make our surfaces sigma t. OK, and we have everything squared. So this is a negative, negative, and a positive. I don't want to try and get a, a positive here. I want to pick psi so I get a positive number here. I guess most choices of psi you see, you get a negative number. In particular, if it's like the gradient's parallel to the gradient of phi, then this term will just dominate. That term will get a negative number. OK, so I want to pick. Uh, psi carefully so that, well, I want this to be small, so its gradient should be roughly orthogonal to this gradient. At least the integral should be small. And I want to compare these two. A gradient phi squared would be bigger than lambda phi squared. 
this. So here's D. I want to look at, I'll pick a small set U like this. It's contained in this set. Okay, this inequality clearly holds on the boundary. It's V is zero on the boundary. So hold on, uh, if I pick U near the boundary. Okay, I'll pick a smooth bump function. I want it to support in U. And now I'm going to multiply that function by sine of k theta. Okay, theta is like polar coordinates theta. Okay, if a k is very large, this will give me a positive derivative. Okay, so this function, it looks like, I guess this is what the zero set looks like. So I'm, I'm adding in these corrugations, and I, I add the corrugations like orthogonal to the grain of the eigenfunction. All right, this is, this is sort of, I th it feels like this is kind of the, the right way to get a positive number there. Okay, and yeah, I guess it's worth noting that, uh, you know, here we, we have this function. It's, it's uh, you know, we, we specifically had to try and get it orthogonal to the gradient of phi. If we pick it parallel to the gradient of phi, we get a negative number here. This is like, okay, the disk is radially symmetric, so the first eigenfunction is radially symmetric. So to say gradient phi is parallel to gradient psi, I'm saying psi is like a radially symmetric function. Okay, so if I put in any radially symmetric function, I'm going to get a negative number here. Okay, and this suggests that uh, maybe it's maximizing among surfaces of revolution. And we have this proposition. Okay, so I just look at surface of revolution and boundaries C. We'll see that the, uh, the disk maximizes lambda 1. Okay. Okay, and the idea of the proof is pretty easy. All right, so, okay, of course, rather than thinking about surface of revolution, we think about curves in a half plane. I'll have this, like, a right half plane. I have a circle here, C, and it's supposed to be a meridian of my surface. I, I guess what I take an arbitrary surface of revolution, and when I say it's eigenvalues less than the eigenvalue in the disk, and I'll parameterize it by some curve alpha. Okay, so I want to try and express the eigenvalue in, in terms of, of the curve more, more directly. All right, the component functions as f and g. And now, well, I use the, the Rayleigh quotient characterization to define it, lambda 1. Okay, and I guess I know I have a surface of revolution. It follows that the first eigenfunction is, is radially symmetric. And so I can just take Rayleigh functions of radially symmetric functions. And for those of us, it's easy to write out the Rayleigh quotients as just uh, two one-dimensional integrals. Okay, the square integral of the gradient looks like u prime squared f over alpha prime. And the square integral of the function looks like u squared f alpha prime. Okay, so I guess the sort of the surface element would be 2 pi f alpha prime. 
Okay, we would have that up here. To the gradient would be u prime over alpha prime, and that's squared. So I get alpha prime in the denominator instead, and two pi's cancel. Okay, and I want u to be equal to zero at c. Okay, now we're looking at this. I guess it seems like, you know, um, this is a function, function on this base of curves, and it sort of splits into kind of two variables here. Two key things are like the first component of alpha and the length of these derivatives. And if I, you know, play with one of them, I guess as you change f, it's, it's unclear what happens to the, the eigenvalue. But if you change the length, let's say you make it shorter, well, you've increased this, I value have decreased this integral. So all the Rayleigh quotients get bigger, and so all the eigenvalues get bigger. Okay, what we can do in this, in this case is we can keep f the same and shorten alpha. We just uh, define a curve here. It'll be, you know, f and zero. Okay, now let u be an eigenfunction for f or for beta. Okay, so this eigenvalue is the Rayleigh quotient of u on beta. Okay, compare this to the Rayleigh quotient of u on alpha. You know, u stays the same, f stays the same, only beta changes, and the length gets longer. So the Rayleigh quotient gets smaller. Okay, and that is probably not the eigenvalue on alpha, but it's an upper bound on the eigenvalue of alpha. Okay, and ideally, you know, this was this was really lambda one of sigma. If we're if we're lucky here, beta will be a nice regular parameterization of the disk. I will just get lambda one of the disk here, okay, and that's kind of the whole thing. Now, I guess if alpha uh, goes back and forth or goes over here. You get an irregular curve beta, but that's just kind of s small details, easy to fix. This is kind of the only real idea you need. All right. Okay, so this is, a, this is sort of the one circle version. And we're talking about surface of revolution R3, so there's not a lot of uh, kind of boundary conditions we could write. The only other thing really we could do is like two circles. So here we'll say, you know, fix two circles. I want there to be some surfaces of revolution R3 whose boundary is the two circles, so they should be parallel, centered about a common axis. I want to look at surface revolution whose boundary is given by the two circles and I try and maximize the eigenvalue. I guess you could use the same idea with the Berger second variation formula. If you don't do surface revolution, you still can't maximize. And anyway, we'll prove among surfaces of revolution, there is one which maximizes lambda. Okay, and the proof follows kind of a familiar uh, general strategy where you take a maximizing sequence. We want to try and say that that stays at some compact set of some space of curves, extract a convergent subsequence, and then 
I guess continuity, if you try to get some kind of continuity argument for the eigenvalue, and see that's a maximizer. And then you expect to lose regularity, you have to you know, rebuild the regularity, you have a, to have a smooth maximizer. Um, I guess first I should say, if your circles are sort of far apart, then your maximizer is going to be, you can just take two disks. You know, your palimpsest splits off into two components and you apply the earlier thing. If they're close together, then we get this uh, hourglass shape. Okay, this will be where we can derive this kind of equation. This is sort of like uh, Berger's first variational formula. It's going to be a critical point, then it should satisfy this equation. Here, uh, what phi is eigenfunction, lambda is eigenvalue, two second fundamental form, and h is the mean curvature. Okay, this is kind of a confusing differential equation, but um, I guess we could say do that. The boundary phi is zero. We get two times this principal curvature equals the mean curvature. So it's going to be like asymptotic to a sphere at the boundary. And then if you pick a point in the middle where phi is maximum, the gradient zero, at that point the equation reduces to h equals zero. So in the middle of look, asymptotic to a catenoid. Okay, and so it kind of transitions smoothly in between. Okay, so I guess the goal, the first goal is I'm going to try and uh, extend the definition to uh, Lipschitz curves and get a maximizer in this class. To do that, I really just need like a, a bound on the length. I can apply our zealous goalie to get a subseries of convergence to a Lipschitz <laughs> curve. Okay, so really the first goal is try and get a bound on the length. Uh, first thing I can do here is have this kind of lemma. So I have two circles here. Some curve alpha. Okay, and I project it down to an annulus. Okay, in this situation, lambda one of alpha is uh, less than lambda one of beta. Okay, this could be useful to control a maximized sequence because let's say we have. Well, we have these sort of two cases, right? In the first case, we say, just see, ask, do the two disks maximize? If they do, then, you know, it exists. You're done. You have to consider the two disks don't maximize. Then you can kind of uh, pull a small hole out. There's a kind of new argument here. You don't change the argument too much. So a small, yeah, you, know, you get an a annulus with a small disk removed. That will still have eigenvalue. Uh, less than the, the maximum you're trying to attain. Okay, so the curves in your maximized zero is they shouldn't project down to that annulus. That implies that their argument is too small. They should project down to a smaller annulus, removing a bigger disk. Okay, so we get a cylinder around the singular axis, and the maximized zero is Malko in that cylinder. Okay, you use the same idea kind of on the other side. You pick a large annulus with a large, uh, small eigenvalue, then the maximizer will won't go outside that cylinder. So you've got these two cylinders. Your maximized sequence of curves has to stay in between the two. OK, and in that situation, you can prove an easy bound on the length of the curve. Because this is the condition that's bounded by the two cylinders. 
you know, A will be positive, B is finite. Then the eigenvalue, we can get an upper bound of uh, B pi squared over A, L squared, L is the length. Okay, and this is useful because it gives us a, an upper bound of the length of a maximizing sequence. If we have a, if the lengths go to infinity, eigenvalues have to go to zero. So for a maximizing sequence, the lengths will be uniformly bound. Okay, so we have a, you know, a maximizing sequence. We parameterize each of them on the same interval, and they have parameterized with constant speed. Now these are all like uniformly Lipschitz functions. So I can apply Arzella Scully, get a convergent <laughs> subsequence. Okay, this is where I guess you have like FK converges to F star. I guess what we have a subsequence. Some curve alpha star. And uh, what happens with the length? We don't have continuity here, but we have like a lower semi-continuity of the length. And we could say, uh, let's say the lengths converge, then the limit will be a Lipschitz constant for my limit curve. Okay, and with these two kinds of situations, these two kinds of limit properties, you could prove uh, the upper semi-continuity of the eigenvalue. And so your limit of your maximizer's use will, will be a maximizer. Okay, so we get a maximizer, but we're in this class of Lipschitz curves. Okay, the regulator kind of comes in two stages. First, we want to get from a Lipschitz curve to a, a C1 curve. This is sort of the, the ugly part. Uh, and uh, I guess there's basically two ideas. Uh, your alpha can't look like, like these. So you can't have, you can't have a corner like this. Okay, and the reason is you'll just take two points and cut it with a small line. And what, it, and what you want to do is very close. So what happens? F changes like uh, continuously or slightly, whereas this length alpha prime it gets decreased kind of discreetly. Okay, so the, you know, when we change F, it's not clear what's happening, but so it'll just change a small amount, whereas this alpha will change a, you know, much more significant amount to show that it dominates. So decreasing this length will be the kind of key, key factor, and the eigenvalue will be increased, proving this corner, curve with the corner wasn't a maximizer. And then the other kind of picture that can't happen. I guess if you have a small circle and your curve intersects it at two points, that's the inside in between there. So it can't look like, like this. Right here, I have intersection at two points, but it's on the outside in between. And you can just uh, do like a circle reflection. And anyway, this operation, uh, yeah, you could do it explicitly enough to see that eigenvalue goes up. Okay, so this reflected curve have a larger eigenvalue first one wasn't maximizing. Okay, and you can kind of push these two ideas and some technical details and get up to C1. All right, and then the second step is to go C1 to C infinity. And it's just based on this lemma. If alpha is C1, then the eigenvalue lambda one is going to be 
differentiable along variations. Okay, so this allows us to do kind of a classic uh, calculus variations thing. So we have a maximum. We could take the derivative. We derive some sort of Euler-Lagrange equations. And uh, these are Lagrange equations. Well, the, uh, the curve is a solution. And the coefficients are in terms of um, the eigenfunction. Okay, so this means if you have regularity on the eigenfunction, you get regularity of the maximizing curve. And of course, the other way is true. You have the eigenvalue equation. It says that the eigenfunction gets regularity from the curve. Okay, so we have this diagram. So at this stage, our curve is C1. We have the eigenvalue equation. I implies a solution. The coefficients are in terms of the curve. Curve is C1, so it implies that the function is C2. And then we have this Euler-Lagrange equation. <laughs> Now the curve is a solution, the coefficients are the eigenfunction. This is C2, you can use the equation to see the curve is C2. Again, you apply eigenvalues again, you get C3 eigenfunction, and so on. So both, both uh, curve and eigenfunction are smooth. Okay, so I want to come back to the, the first problem. We have one circle, and I want to I want to push this further to, to higher eigenvalues. So we fix the circle, we look at all the surface resolution with this one boundary component on the circle. And you can prove actually the disk maximizes uh, every eigenvalue. Okay. So this is um yeah, I guess in, in, one, in one way it's easier, in another way it's harder. The way it's harder is that um, the first eigenvalue it inherits symmetry. From, the eigenfunction inherits symmetry from the surface. So you know, surface resolution, the first eigenfunction would be radially symmetric. Um, for the higher eigenvalues, you can do like a separation of variables. You don't get a symmetric. You get like sine of k theta or something like that. Okay, and so you you have to kind of like think of a eigenvalues with two parameters, k and n. K will be like the the uh, k and sine of k theta, and you look at what is this uh, min max.
you can still uh, reduce everything to one dimensional integrals, but this time it works like this. Okay, so here you take a You take the minimum over n dimensional subspaces. Okay, it's so like the mini max characterization. The right, the right subspace would be generated by the first n eigenfunctions. Okay, then that one will have a minimum value here. That's, that'll be lambda, you know, k, n, n. And now we've, in, we've indexed them with two integers. And I guess more natural that they have one integer. But we'll just prove that, uh, you know, these, each of these is maximized by the disk. It'll, it'll just follow that these are maximized as well. Okay, and I guess this is harder because of this alpha prime here. So before we could say, we could really, uh, just how focus on the length. Showing the length was such a big deal, it, it decreased, or showing the length increased this square root of the gradient, and it decreased the square root of the function. Now we have this term. It's more complicated, right? Okay, so this time, um, this time projecting straight down, it's not clear if that's going to uh, that's going to increase the eigenvalue because of this term. What we can do is uh, cut out an annulus here. <coughs> I guess here we want like k squared uh, over f be less than lambda f. Okay, and I guess for lambda, I should choose like the, the maximum value I want to attain here. Okay, if I'm outside of here, then decreasing the length here will have a bigger impact than decreasing the length there. So I could take this stretch of it and project it down. Okay, but the part inside that is kind of a bad neighborhood. I can't, I can't play with that. In this neighborhood, it's actually more effective to uh, decrease f while keeping the length the same. So I kind of want to just roll this over, push it flat. OK, so in this parameterization, I, uh, here's beta, here's gamma. I go from beta to gamma by keeping the length the same and pushing f forward. I guess I have to have like this kind of homotopy. Okay, and I guess now it's time to attack if you're going to construct this homotopy. You want to prove that it's monotonic along this homotopy. Okay, so these are some technical difficulties. Okay, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave it here. Okay, thank you very much, Sinan. Very nice lecture. <laughs>